Welcome, Lucas. All right. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, what was sort of mistitled as uh, machine learning for <laughs> human and social sciences. Uh, it still is kind of that, but uh, I just want to level set with everybody what we will be talking about today is not so much uh, examples or, or concrete steps you can take to use machine learning in your field of uh, human and social sciences research. It will be uh, a more conceptual workshop to try and convince you that you probably already know machine learning. So uh, today we will talk a lot about how statistics and machine learning are closely related. And hopefully that will give you the tools or, or rather it will make you realize that you already have the tools to dive deeper into machine learning if you wish to do so. And uh, you already have everything you need to get started and eventually start using this in your own research. All right. So uh, before we jump into the actual content, I would like everybody to uh, go to this URL here. Uh, one second, I'll have to stop sharing my screen. I will share again. I'll put this uh, link in the uh, Zoom chat. And I invite everybody to go over there. It's a Google spreadsheet. And I'll start sharing my screen again so we can all look at the same thing. So sharing. And uh, everybody should be here in this Google spreadsheet. I would ask everybody to find your name here on column B and claim your username, which is here on column A. Once you found your name and your username, just write down uh, your name here on column C or write yes, like some of you are doing. Just write something so we know that you are here and you have claimed your username from column A. Once you've done that, I will invite everybody to go over to this link here on the top left corner of your screen. So uh, ML en.calculquebec.cloud. So you can copy and paste that on your browser. And once you go there, you should see this. And then you can enter that username. So user some number, enter it here. And the password is right here in the Google spreadsheet as well, where it says, oh, it's still in French. So mot de passe should be password. So you can copy and paste that. That guy here is your password for uh, that other website. All right. So I will enter my own username, which is instructor. And then my password, uh, I got to go get it here because I don't remember what it is. It's not the same as yours. So give me one second to grab my own password. From uh, here. And then once you enter your username and your password here, click on sign in. And let's make sure that everybody lands in the same place and uh, that it's working for everybody. So it should take a moment. There's a whole lot of us connecting to the same server at the same time, so this could be, uh, you know, a few seconds. Shouldn't take too long though. So let's wait. Oh, okay. So you should see this appear eventually. And at some point, you will see this happen. So a blank screen that is going to turn into something. Oh, there you go. Oh, so there are questions here in the chat. So uh, Kay Chandler is asking, can you clarify, are we supposed to go here? Yes, you're supposed to go there, that website there. And the password is here in that Google spreadsheet right here where it says password. So the password is hss-ml-en. All right. 
So enter your username and password, click on sign in. And uh, you guys shouldn't see this here because I am uh, one step ahead. You should see this. And on your left-hand side, you should see this. So please uh, raise your hand if you're not here. If you haven't got, you haven't been able to get to this point here. You don't see what I see here on my screen. Please raise your hand. So there's a, a few uh, hands raised here. Uh, let me check how many exactly. So uh, Dana and uh, Kay Chandler. So what uh, what seems to be the problem? You try to enter your username and your password. Oh, what is the username? So right here in the Google spreadsheet, look up your name here in column B. So you're right here, your user 11. That is your username. Oh, that makes a difference. Yeah. So I uh, give it a try. And uh, Dana McFarland, what, what seems to be the problem there? That was the problem. Yeah, oh, that was the user 46 for Dana. Perfect. All right. And then uh, Ling Ling is asking, can I get the uh, link to the spreadsheet? And it's right here. Whoops. That is not it. Let me grab the link from here. The link is right here. So you can go there, claim your username. Just make sure you write down something here on column C so we know you're here. Uh, thank you, Wade. It's on Slack as well, for those of you who are uh, following uh, the chat on Slack. Claim your username, grab the password, go to this URL here, enter your username and password, and you should see this ultimately. All right, so we're going to leave this here for now. We're going to go back to that, uh, that presentation. Going to go through the conceptual part here, and then we're going to come back to this platform where we're going to run our uh, exercises, our hands-on uh, portion. All right, so let's go back, go into presentation mode. And let's get started. Let me try to convince you that you probably already know machine learning. So Joyce already introduced me. We can skip this part. You already know who I am. And let's go straight to what exactly we're going to talk about today. So the starting point is going to be statistics. I am assuming that most of you have taken a course in statistics at one point in your life, a probability and statistics course. So please raise your hand if you have never taken a statistics course in your life, never been exposed to Statistics, you're still a pure, innocent soul. Raise your hand if that's you. All right, so no hands being raised. Oh, one oh. hand there. Okay, so we're going to go slow here. We're going to start from the beginning. We're going to introduce uh, statistics conceptually, and we're going to build onto that uh, until we get to machine learning. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about statistical inference and how we use models in statistics to model stuff. And uh, how what is machine learning and how is it different from statistics? We're going to finish the conceptual part with a little bit of a dictionary or a decoder ring, uh, showing you the terms that we use in uh, machine learning that are very computer science centric. Uh, and I'll show you what is the translation in statistical jargon. So uh, many things that you might already be familiar with, they just have a different name in machine learning, but uh, different names might confuse us. Uh, they did confuse me when I first started getting into machine learning as a statistician. Uh, I did get confused. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. And we're going to finish the day with uh, some hands-on examples so you can see in practice all of those concepts we're going to talk about today. Well, so oh, that was uh, fast. All right, so the starting point, statistics. 
what is in general, or at first, when you first learn about statistics, what is the goal of it? So the idea is you have a problem at hand, might be a research problem, where you have a population to consider. And in that population, you're interested in observing something about these people, or you want to measure something about these people. You want to measure this quantity called mu here. Let's just give it a Greek letter, because in statistics and mathematics, people like Greek letters. So we want to observe or measure some characteristic mu about these people here in a population. Sometimes, or should I say most of the time, it is very impractical or sometimes even impossible for us to observe an entire population of individuals to just compute whatever mu is we can go and ask or measure or observe. It is hard to do so. Uh, examples abound, but whenever you're talking about, say, the population of a whole city, uh, maybe a big city like Montreal, or Toronto, or, or Vancouver, you want to uh, find out what is uh, the average height of the population, maybe. Imagine uh, going around with a measuring tape and, and measuring the height of each and every individual who lives in the city. That would be pretty impossible or at least very impractical. So statistics comes to the rescue as a tool for us to avoid doing that. So observing or measuring whatever it is that we're trying to do in the entire population. Instead, what we do is we take a sample out of that population and we make our measurements or our observations in the sample, something that is much more manageable. So instead of going out and measuring the height of each and every individual in a whole city, you can uh, find a few members of that population and do your measurements in that subgroup of the population called a sample. Then statistics provides the mathematical framework to answer this critical question here. I measured mu whatever mu uh, turned out to be in our example here, the height uh, or the average height of the individuals in the population, it turned out to be 10, 10 whatever unit of measurement we want to use here, turned out to be 10. Is this a good estimate of the average mu in the population? Or is this reflective of what happens in the actual population? So statistics provide the mathematical, the formal framework to answer this very question. Whatever I did observe in the sample, is that a good estimate of the real thing in the population? I'm going to pause here for a few seconds and ask any questions so far. Are we okay? What questions you have about this? Lucas, we have been asked if there will be, uh, if your slides will be available, and I assume they will. Uh, but I don't have a copy to put in yet in the Slack. Yes, they will. And uh, yeah, we, we we'll can take care of that. Yeah. Share that in a, on Slack later. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Good so far? So most of you uh, took a course in probability and statistics, so this is not news for, for anybody here. All right. So some applications of this principle uh, of statistical inference. So using the value observed or measured in a sample to talk about that same value in the population, we call that statistical inference. And applications of this principle in research or you know, just uh, whatever situation you find yourself in where it's impossible or impractical to do things to the whole population, uh, you could take two subgroups of the population uh, selected based on some uh, feature. For example, uh, sex. You could uh, pick individuals out of the population that identify as men, and then uh, individuals in the population that identify as women, and have those two different samples, measure something about them, and ask yourself, is this quantity mu in the group that identify as man 
equal or different than the same mu measured in the group that identify as women. And then you can use statistical inference to uh, generalize this insight that you have find, found to the population. Another example, you could perform an intervention in one of the groups. So for example, you picked people at random from the population and just separated them into two groups randomly. And then you as the scientist uh, apply a treatment or do some sort of intervention to one of the groups, but not the other. So for example, you could give a, a drug to group one and not to group two. You could uh, use uh, a way of teaching statistics to group one and not to group two. And then ask yourself, is the outcome uh, of some measured feature uh, of these people equal in the non-intervention group and the intervention group? So for example, if uh, my intervention was a novel way of teaching statistics, and then group two just learn statistics the good old regular way, I can measure uh, their knowledge of statistics by means of a test and see, uh, did my intervention make a difference? Is the score different on group one than on group two? And I can try to generalize this to the population and eventually conclude that, yes, my intervention does make a difference. Another popular way of applying the, this concept is, well, if I take a sample of individuals out of a population, can I see what is the impact of certain factors, such as age, the city where the people here come from, their sex or their level of income? Do those factors have any impact on the quantity mu that I'm interested in measuring? So for example, let's say mu is... Uh, whether or not you're likely to go to prison. So if I take a random sample of people and I look at their age, city where they come from, their sex, uh, their level of income, I can see, or do any of those factors have an impact on whether or not somebody is likely to end up in prison at one point in their life? Good so far. Any questions about any of this applications of the principle of Statistical inference. I will be uh, pausing a lot to ask if there are any questions. I will be interacting a lot, asking uh, pop quiz style questions sometimes. So don't be shy. No, please don't be shy. Participate uh, whether you want to unmute yourself and uh, answer my questions. Uh, out loud or use the chat that's up to you but uh, I invite everybody to to participate right and and Lucas for the yeah as we get uh, new people into the room who've arrived late I'm reposting your links so that they can uh, get caught up so great okay thank you yeah, you're welcome all right so let's keep going here Okay, so let's talk about some actual techniques that you might have used in your research or you might have seen in a probability and statistics course at some point uh, that illustrate you know, those three examples we, we just looked at. So uh, take ANOVA, for example, so-called analysis of variance. Those are models or ways of describing things that we observe where uh, I am trying to answer this kind of question. So is there any effect from my intervention or a treatment in a response variable? So in the example we had before, there was a scientist intervening on group one and then no intervention on group two. And we were asking the question, is there any difference in the uh, observed, the, the measured quantity move between those two groups? Usually, this is the technique people use, or not usually, but often, uh, people use this technique called ANOVA to answer that kind of question. And ANOVA, what it is, is I take my variable of interest, the thing, the thing that I am trying to observe or measure, I take the average in those, let's assume, two groups for now uh, as my baseline, and then I see what is the effect of my intervention in one of those two groups. 
to see if, well, this guy here, Tau, is it statistically significant? Is there any Tau in the population? Is this thing uh, making a difference? So, for example, example that we just gave uh, a few slides ago, is there a difference in the measured learning outcomes between students exposed to novel teaching method A, novel teaching method B, and a control group not using any novel method? So this is the kind of technique uh, we're going to use to answer that question. Another popular uh, statistical tool that is widely used is so-called linear regression. And it is used to answer questions of the type, if I change a dependent variable x by one unit, by how much does that change my response variable y? One example of doing that is, well, if I want to answer the question, by how much does the income level of somebody change on average for each additional year of education? So x would be years of education, y would be level of income, and if I change a uh, year of education by one, how much does that change my level of income? I would use this kind of model to describe this type of relationship between those two variables, x and y. Finally, another tool that you might have used already in your research or have seen in a statistics course is logistic regression. So this one is what we use when we want to answer a question of the kind, if I change a dependent variable x by one unit, by how much do the odds of some outcome change? So an example of that is how much more likely, on average, a student is to pass a class for each additional weekly hour of study. So the variable x in this example is weekly hours of study. And if I change that by one, by how much do the odds of that student passing or failing the class will change? Good so far. Any questions? Everybody seen this or something like this at one point in their life? Any questions about any of it? Everybody good? Okay. Looks good. Yep. Let's keep going. So what can we notice about everything I just said so far? We were looking at those uh, equations here to model the things we've seen. We, the kind of question, the way we were phrasing it, is kind of forcing us to look at those guys here, those betas. We were focused in uh, interpreting what those betas mean. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take linear regression as an example. I said that this tool answers the kind of question by how much does income change on average for each additional year of education? So if X is years of education and Y is income, then if I change X by one, y will increase by beta. So I'm going to use my data, my observations, to figure out what is this beta. And I am focusing on interpreting this guy. This guy is by how much y will increase if I increase x by 1. Similarly, same thing here. If x is weekly hours of study, and why is whether or not a student will pass a class, then beta is by how much the odds of passing the class will increase if I increase x by one. So again, beta is critical here in my interpretation of this model of whatever it is that I observed of my data. So that is key point number one in statistics, our focus is always on interpreting what it, the parameters of my model mean. Second thing that most of you might be familiar with is, well, interpreting the parameters is one thing, but are they significant? 
is my data, the value of beta that I found in my data, reflective of what is really going on in the population? Are they statistically significant? So there are many statistical tests, depending on what kind of model you're fitting to your data, to figure out, to answer that question. Can, can I take this conclusion and uh, call it statistically significant? These models, linear regression, ANOVA, logistic regression, usually the tests for the, the significance of the parameters assume that errors are distributed normally so that things follow normal distributions, that bell-shaped curve that uh, we like so much in statistics. So that is one pretty strong assumption we usually make when using those tools in statistics. And really, we make lots of other assumptions without really questioning it when we use those tools in statistics. Uh, there are tests to verify each and every assumption. And uh, I will assume, here's me making, making an assumption, that uh, you have had trouble before with many of those tests. When some of your assumptions do not hold, you have had to you know, uh, wrangle your data around and try to make them hold uh, so you can use those techniques from statistics. And what's more, all of those models that we used as examples here so far are linear. What does that mean, that models are linear? Well, oh, I went too uh, far here. So uh, we will talk about that. Uh, linear means that, well, the variables that you, you have in your, in your data that you have observed, the relationship between them is linear, meaning if one goes up, the other probably goes up. Uh, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. All right, so this is the statistics, just a little kind of refresher for most of you. You have seen this before. You have had nightmares about this before. Uh, I know I have. Um, so what is machine learning? How, how does machine learning fit into this whole thing? And how is it related to statistics? Well, it's all about perspective. So machine learning is really, if you look deep into it, just uh, another uh, way of doing statistics. It is really a re-release of things from the past that we've been using forever. Uh, we gave them an extreme makeover with new cool names and uh, more computing power. And uh, that's how we got machine learning, essentially. How so? Let's go back to those three types of statistical models we talked about. So ANOVA, linear regression, and logistic regression. We were, uh, the type of question we were trying to answer just now kind of forced us to reason about what is the role of those parameters in those equations here? What if we reframe our question? So instead of asking the uh, ANOVA question, as we were asking before, that was, uh, is there an effect? If I intervene in one group and not another, is there an effect to my intervention? What if instead of that, we ask, if I pick one student, any given student, taught using the novel teaching method A, what learning outcome should I expect to see? So I don't care anymore about the question, is there an effect? I care about individual students. If I apply novel teaching method A, what grade are they going to get? I'm trying to predict what is the outcome. Same thing with linear regression. If instead of me asking, what is the effect of changing X by one? If instead I ask, uh, pick a particular observation, a particular person in my sample. And if I observe a certain value of X, what value of Y do I expect to see? So it's no longer about if I change X by one, by how much X, uh, Y changes. It is about if I know X, what is Y? So going back to the example we had before, if a certain individual has studied for a certain number of years, then what is the income level that I should expect them to have? And same thing for a logistic regression. Instead of asking, by changing X by one unit, 
how does that affect the odds of the outcome? Instead, if I ask, if I observe X in a certain person, what is the outcome I should expect to observe? Again, going back to the example, if I pick a certain stu a student and I know they've studied for a certain number of hours a week, do I expect them to pass or fail? So it's no longer about a general relationship where I'm worried about the parameters. It is about making predictions about individuals. So the key points now are we focus on predicting the response given the dependent variables. We're not focusing on interpreting parameters anymore. There are no tests for the significance of those predictions. More on this later. That might sound weird for uh, those of you more statistically minded, or we're going to come back to that later. But there are no tests like we used to do in, uh, in good old statistics. We don't care as much about the distribution of the errors. So if things are not normal, they don't follow the normal distribution, we don't fret as much as we would in statistics. That we will do what we will do anyway. Uh, we will fit those models here anyway. We don't care too much about deviations from normality. Uh, it's still going to be important, just not as important as it was in the world of statistics. And really, we will not make as many assumptions in general. Uh, why do we make so many assumptions in statistics? It's mostly because of these guys here, the significance tests. So uh, for our significant significance tests to hold, for us to be able to jump to conclusions eventually, uh, all of those assumptions have to hold, or else the mathematics behind the tests break. But we are not making any tests anymore, so we don't care as much about making those assumptions. If they're true, that's going to help us, yes, but we don't care about them as much. And finally, well, what if my data behaves nonlinearly? So one of the difficulties in statistics is there are ways to model observations nonlinearly, things that are nonlinearly related exist in the world, and there are ways to model them. But that messes in, in many ways with the mathematics that guarantees for us that those tests here uh, mean anything. Since there are no tests, then in machine learning, we are freer to experiment with those nonlinear models since we don't care too much about assumptions anymore. So one example. If we take that example we were examining just now, where we had years of education versus income, well, we can expect, yes, it is a linear relation that the more educated you are, on average, we expect you to have a higher income. But let's uh, introduce a twist here. Let's say that, well, if you keep uh, just educating yourself and you never enter the job market, for example, well, let's assume that makes your expected level of income drop. If you just go on educating yourself, your expected level of income drops. Let's assume that's true. How do I model this? I can't use linear regression anymore because linear regression, uh, the way we, we framed it just now, uh, will draw a straight line to try and explain my observations. That's clearly not the case anymore. It's not a straight line. I need something more curvy. So same thing for logistic regression. Uh, whereas before I had, uh, the more somebody studies every week, the more likely they are to pass a class. You will always have the odd student that doesn't study a lot and still passes, and the odd student that studies a lot and doesn't pass. But what if I have a whole group here that maybe studied so much that they got burnt out and they all failed the class? because they were so stressed, they couldn't take it anymore, and they all failed. How do I explain this using this kind of curve here, this model? Well, I don't. I need a different curve. I need a different model to explain something like this. So in machine learning, what we will do is 
we will use any function f of x that is not restricted to uh, straight lines anymore, like in linear regression, or even uh, just polynomials. Maybe some of you have done this before, trying to use polynomials instead of uh, straight lines to fit your data. So using things like a parabola or maybe a, a higher degree polynomial to capture those curvy relationships. Well, in machine learning, we can use any kind of function, f of x, where f is limited only by your imagination. We mean that very literally. In general, in machine learning, uh, we will pose the conceptual problem as such. We'll assume that there is an unknown function f star that describes perfectly the relationship between some variable y and a bunch of variable x. So uh, imagine I have some data that I have observed in my study, in my research, where I have maybe 10 uh, variables x and one variable y. And we want to find out what is the relation between y and all of those x's here. We'll assume, we'll start from that very strong assumption that, well, there is an unknown function f star that links those two. If I know x1 up to x10, I can find out what y is. Uh, so somebody is asking here on the chat, do machine learning models tell us the f of x that they choose to fit the data? We're going to get to that in the next slide. So speaking of this, we're going to use the data to estimate f star. In general, just like in statistics, this unknown relationship f star exists in a population. Typically, I will not have access to a population, so I have to work with a sample. So we're going to use that sample, the data we've observed, to estimate this guy that we have just assumed exists in the population. Good so far? Any questions about any of this? It's starting to get uh, a bit different from uh, statistics. So feel free to ask any questions. So Lucas, are you saying that the, the patterns observed in the data is what in the end tells you what the what the function is? Uh -oh. Yes, but also there's more than that. We're, okay, okay. Yeah. And I'm I'm an absolute baby in this. I I did take statistics and I cried my way through it, and it's 30 years ago. So that's <laughs> great. Um, so remember the pain. That's yeah. uh <laughs> we all love statistics, don't we? <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Um, I'll be quiet. <laughs> all right. So again, we will use our data to estimate this guy we assume that exists in the population. Uh, there's a question here in the chat. Is each instance of X a linear relationship with Y? So this is a, an important question, if I understand it right. When we use those uh, linear models to model data, where in general, uh, if you increase one variable, the other one increases as well. Uh, what we were saying here is, well, not every instance will fall perfectly on the line here. We're saying that on average, years of education is equal to whatever this line here represents, a beta zero plus a beta one times X. It's gonna be on average, more or less equal to this. So, Probably approximately right. That is how we uh, phrase it uh, formally. It, it doesn't sound like a formal thing to say, but it is. When you fit a model like this to data where there is variation, we're saying that this description is probably approximately right. On average, it is more or less equal to this. All right, so it's not each instance individually. Okay, so going back to this, we're going to use the data to estimate the relationship in the population. 
So we go back to the starting point. We go back to statistics, just like before. It is impractical, sometimes impossible to figure out what is F star in the population because I can't measure X and Y in the whole population. So what we do is we work with the sample. We figure out what F of X is in the sample. It is equal to some crazy function, not necessarily linear. And then we ask ourselves, is this a good estimate? Does this hold in the population? How do we do this? Well, step number one is figuring out what is f of x? What is our estimate of f star? So typically, the workflow is going to look like this. You collect some data with a number of variables. It doesn't have to be a small number of variables. It can be a huge number of variables. And you run it through a black box containing a machine learning algorithm. This is another buzzword that we hear a lot. AI algorithms, machine learning algorithms. What they are? Well, they are recipes. Recipes to do what? For finding what is the function f that best fits my sample. That is all a machine learning algorithm is. is a way of finding what is the function f that best fits my sample. There are different recipes that are going to be good uh, depending on what kind of data you have. So the recipes that follow are good when the response variable, so the thing you're trying to predict, is a quantitative variable, meaning it is a number that represents an actual quantity. So we have linear regression, just like before in statistics. This type of function, f of x, is good when we observe things just like in that graph we had just now, where if you increase one variable, on average, more or less, the other variable is going to increase as well, linearly. Then if you start to get some curves, just like we had in that other example, if it grows up until a certain point and then it falls, then maybe a polynomial would be a better way of modeling those kinds of observations. So a polynomial of degree two, for example, that draws a parabola. So if uh, whatever it is that I'm trying to model goes up and then goes down, just like a parabola, then using a polynomial of degree two as an estimate of F star, that could be a good idea. I could use polynomials of higher degree if my data is curvier, if there's bounces and, and things like that. Well, sometimes not even that is enough. Sometimes my data, the relationship between X and Y in my sample is so crazy that a polynomial is not going to cut it. Or if I need a polynomial, it's a polynomial of an incredibly high degree. Uh, I don't want to do that. I want to use something simpler that is uh, going to finish running in my supercomputer uh, fast enough for me to, I don't know, submit a paper, I have a deadline or something. So I can use a different function. Uh, support vector machines. That's another type of function, f of x, that is good at modeling things that are, where the relationship is a bit crazy. Decision trees is another type of function, f of x, that is good at modeling relationships that are pretty crazy. And finally, neural networks, another buzzword. Uh, I'm sure everybody here has heard at some point in the past uh, five years or so, this name here, neural networks. What the heck is a neural network? It is just a type of function, f of x, that we're not going to try to write down here using mathematics, because this would be pretty long. We're going to come back to neural networks later and try to demystify those guys. Uh, we'll, I'll show you in mathematics exactly what is this. And uh, hopefully that's going to kind of uh, dispel some of that magic around the term neural networks. Same thing goes for scenarios where the thing you're trying to predict is no longer a quantity, but uh, you know, it's a categorical variable. So even though it is a number that you have in your in your data set, it is not representing a quantity. It's a flag representing a class or a category. So in those cases, we have different types of functions, f of x, 
that are good at doing that as well. So in our first case, things were zero or one, a student passes or fails. And if a student studies more time, they are more likely to pass. So a linear function like the logistic function is good at modeling that type of scenario. Uh, in the second scenario we had, if a student keeps on studying more and more, at some point it becomes too much and they're more likely to fail the class. So it goes up and then down. This first function is not going to cut it. So we might want to use something like this, a polynomial logistic regression. You don't have to read through this here. I'm going to show you uh, with code later on. Uh, it's much easier to write this in code than it is in math. Uh, support vector classifiers for whenever the relationship is really, really crazy. It goes up, then down, and then goes back, and then goes forward, uh, and so on and so forth. You, The more complicated you think the relationship f of x is in your sample, then uh, the further down and the less here you should go. So for example, neural networks, they're good at modeling things that are uh, crazy, crazy relationships that go up, down, up, down, and then super up, and then down a bit, and then super up again, and then super down. So uh, depending on how complicated you think f of x is, you're going to pick one of those types of function f of x to fit to your data. There are questions here in the chat. So uh, Carolyn mentioned structural equation modeling. Yes, that is one way of modeling more complicated relationships, even though you're most of the time still going to use uh, linear regressions in, in most uh, implementations of SAM. Uh, but yes, you could use that to model things that are more complicated. Uh, and then Tyler is saying, I assume that random forest falls under decision trees. Yes. A random forest is a collection of decision trees. Uh, yeah, in computer science, people like to use those cool names for, for things. Um, but that's what it is. A random forest is a collection of decision trees. All right. Uh, before we go into how to determine, once I've found an estimate, I picked one of those types here of f of x, and I found the parameters, betas, that fit best my data, whatever I observed. Now, how do I determine if my estimate is any good? Before we go into that, another pause for questions. Does anyone has, uh, have any questions? Um, hi, Lucas. First of all, thank you so much. This is amazing so far. Um, I did have a question. I wanted to know, are these functions being estimated simultaneously for every single X or is an iterative process? Do you specify that in a machine learning approach? Great question. So it depends on the recipe you're using. So for each one of those types of F of X, there will be a number of different algorithms that let you find what are the parameters that best fit your data. Some of them will take your entire data set in one pass and uh, use, you know, do matrix operations, linear algebra, using your entire table. Some of them do require that. Support vector machines, I'm hovering over it because that is one notable example where uh, it is not an iterative algorithm. Uh, it takes the whole thing at once. Then uh, neural networks, famously, uh, the algorithms we use to fit neural networks to data are mostly or heavily iterative. Even if you pass uh, your entire data set as one, as one big matrix, you're going to do several passes uh, until your ne neural network is fit to your data. All right, so it depends. Uh, there are iter iterative ways of uh, fitting a linear regression, and you can do it uh, with pen and paper analytically. So you don't have to do it iteratively at all. So it depends. There are many options. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So uh, there's a question here. The crazier functions, do they articulate a pattern? 
So uh, sometimes they do. Sometimes all they're doing is mimicking uh, a polynomial. Sometimes that's what they're doing. Sometimes the relationship is so crazy that it's not going to look like any other type of function that we would recognize. It would look like something crazy. Any other questions? Good. All right. So let's keep going. Back to our question. All right. I used one of those black box algorithms. I fit an f of x of my choice to my data. Now, how do I determine is this a good estimate? So we said there are no statistical tests. That's usually how you do it in statistics. Uh, that's not how we're going to do it in machine learning. We're going to do it empirically. We're not going to use tests. What do I mean uh, we do it empirically? Well, so first, take your population, draw a sample, and fit f of x to the sample. Next, take another separate sample that you did not use to estimate f of x and evaluate the estimate here. What does that mean? Take whatever your variables x were in this uh, separate sample and plug it into f of x, see if you got the right answer, if you got the right y. If you didn't, then go back here and change f of x. Try a different algorithm, try a different recipe, and see if you get the right answer here. Keep doing this. Fit f of x here, try it here. Fit f of x here, try it here until you get a satisfactory answer. We're going to go back to what satisfactory means, but it means that most of the time, so for most of the uh, elements in your evaluation sample, you got the right answer. Once you did get mostly the right answer in the second data set, draw a third data set and try it here and see if you get mostly the right answer here too. Why? Why do we do this? So let's break it down. What is really happening here? So, oops. In the first sample, in the first sample where the one where you fit f of x, you're minimizing the in-sample error. So that is what, no matter what algorithm you picked to uh, fit f of x to your data, this is what the algorithm will be doing. It will try to minimize some measure of error in that sample. So for example, if you have a quantitative, quantitative response, one thing that is uh, widely used is minimize the squared error. So what is the squared error? Uh, if I go back to linear regression here and I plug a value X and I get a prediction Y, I will compare my prediction Y to the actual Y that is present in my data and I'll see what is the difference between them. I'll take that difference and I'll take the square of the difference. So I'll do this for each and every observation in my data set, I'll calculate what is the uh, squared difference between my prediction and the actual value. Then I'll take the average, see what is the average squared error I incurred into using this function that I fit to my data. And I want to minimize that. I want to find what is the collection of parameters of f of x such that that squared error average square error or mean squared error is minimized. That is going to be the function that best fits my data set. There are other measures of error, like the uh, mean absolute error. So instead of computing the error and taking the square, I take the absolute value, for example, or the root mean squared error. So I calculate the error, take the square, and then take the square root of that, or the log likelihood. So we're not going to talk about this one, but uh, it's another measure of error. 
And all algorithms, what they do to fit your function f of x to your sample is they try to minimize the in-sample error. But the in-sample error is not what we are actually concerned with. We're not worried about minimizing this guy from the get-go. What we really want is to find a function that generalizes to the whole population. So what measure of error should I be trying to minimize? The out-of-sample error. So I want to make good predictions on individuals that were not used to fit my function f of x. Is that clear to everybody? Does that make sense? This is going to give me an indication that whatever function f of x I found is probably a good estimate of the true f star. If I pick that estimate, and it works on things that were not used to fit it, that is a good indication that uh, it is maybe a good estimate of F star. We call that the out of sample error. So this is that second sample where we evaluate our F of X. Same thing, I am going to look inside of the second sample, what is the value of the error that I'm incurring in by using my estimate f of x. And I'm going to use, if the variable is quantitative, the same metrics as I use for the in-sample error. So the square of the error or the absolute error, uh, value of the error and so on and so forth. But you'll see that if my variable is, uh, the thing that I'm trying to predict is a categorical variable, I will use uh, a different metric. So for the in-sample error, I will try to minimize uh, this guy here called the cross entropy or the log likelihood. Don't worry about what they are. Uh, they're measures of error. And in my evaluation sample, I will look for accuracy. So in the case of students who either pass or fail a class, I can uh, fit f of x to my initial data set. And then in a second sample, I can see, well, if I know the number of hours each student in here studied, how many of them do I get right? My model predicts to pass and then they do pass. And how many my model predicts to fail and they do fail? That is simply the accuracy. How many responses were predicted correctly? So I can use that as a measure of the uh, error incurred into by my model. Uh, there's a there are questions here in the chat. So Dana says, having never taken stats, only being stats adjacent, it seems like testing assumptions would be really important as a precondition in this uh, evaluative process. Yes. So uh, we said right in the beginning that one of the big differences between machine learning and stats is that we don't make too many assumptions in general about our data. The one big assumption that we make is what is the shape of f of x? That is the big one that we make. If you pick a function that is not flexible, meaning a function you believe from the get-go that f of x is not very complicated, I expect the relationship to be linear, for instance, that is a pretty big assumption, because if it turns out that in the population, your uh, function is not linear at all, then uh, you're stuck. You're stuck with, with a straight line. Whereas some of those other functions here are more flexible. So even if in your uh, training set, we're going to get to, to that later, but in your sample that you use to fit f of x, uh, things look linear. Some of those functions can find hints that in general, things are not linear and they will do much better. So one of the big assumptions we make is this, is the flexibility or the shape of f of x. So you're, you're right. Uh, the evaluation sample is a good place for you to look for those hints that maybe the model, the type of f of x you chose is too restrictive, all right? Does that answer your, your question there, Dana?
All right. So uh, another question here. Does the number of picked data points in the second and third sample compared to the first one matter? Yes. So uh, there is a trade-off here. And it's a fine line we have to walk in machine learning because we want to use as many data points as possible to fit f of x in the first place. So we don't risk uh, having it picked exactly the points that happen to draw a straight line and leave out of my sample, the first sample, the ones that would hint to me that, well, the relationship, there's a curve. So we want to use as many points as possible in this first sample and uh, use as few as I can get away with in the second and third samples. So in practice, what people do is, uh, is a heuristic. We use 80 to 90% of our observations to fit the data, and then uh, 10 to 20% to evaluate and reevaluate, with this guy usually being bigger than this third order guy here. All right. But uh, it is a fine line. Sometimes you will have to use more than 90% to fit your data. Maybe that was not enough to pick on hints that you know f of x might have a different shape than you thought. So it is a fine line to walk. And one that involves cost as well. You know, is it costly to go get new data points? If it's not, then use your entire data set to fit f of x, then go get some new observations to test it. But if it is costly, well, then you have to think about it uh, a little bit more. All right. Any other questions about this? Is it clear? The uh, three-step approach to uh, determine whether or not your estimate of f of x is any good. Yeah, all right. So uh, before we jump into the hands-on portion, I just want to take the time here to show you uh, the terms we've been using here are mostly from the field of statistics, but in the literature or even in blog posts out in the internet, you're going to find those terms here on the right-hand side. So this is the machine learning jargon uh, created by computer science people um, that is very different, but it means the same thing as the stuff we use to do in statistics. So for example, estimating f of x or fitting a model to your data, people in computer science call that training a model. The sample where you use to estimate your f of x in the first place, people call that a training set, and so on and so forth. You can uh, refer back to this here. Whenever you come across one of those CS terms, you can see what they really mean in, in statistics. All right. A uh, big one is, well, a learning algorithm. We hear that one a lot. Uh, all it is, as we've seen in a previous slide, it is an estimation method. You know, I'm, I'm using linear regression. I'm using iterative uh, uh, least squares to fit a straight line to my data. Well, they're going to call that. I'm using linear regression as a learning algorithm. Well, it is just linear regression after all. So you can uh, refer back to this. So Drew's saying there, wait to demystify ML. <laughs> it should be on a shirt. <laughs> yeah, could, could be on a shirt. Then you break into that, uh, what's the conference called? Uh, no rips. And uh, people are going to, oh, who called the statistician? So uh, let's see things in practice now. So let's all switch tabs and go back to that uh, platform we all logged into just now. So Jupyter Lab. All right, does everybody hear? If you're not here, if you are not looking at the same thing as I am here on my screen, uh, can you raise your hand? Okay, so everybody is here. I'll assume. All right, so I invite everybody to go here to this menu on the left-hand side and click on this first folder here, Intro to Machine Learning. So double-click on it, 
and you should see this. And then uh, if you double click on any of those orange thingies here, you're gonna see some material pop up on your screen. So the first one, for example, this one is uh, the same material we just gone through on my slides with a little bit more math. So for those of you who are more uh, mathematically or statistically inclined, feel free to uh, read through this. It is same stuff I just said, but there's more formality here. Uh, the one we're going to use today is the second one here called supervised learning, supervised part one, rather. So let's double click on that one. Taking a bit to load. You're all clicking on it at the same time. There you go. All right. So the first part here is going to be, again, same thing we just uh, gone through on the slides with more math, more formality. So feel free to read through it. Uh, but let's scroll down until we see some, uh, some code here. So right here, if you got to this part, stop scrolling. It's right below this, uh, this diagram here. So I will do something here. Uh, Actually, no, let's, let's do this together. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Jupyter, which is this coding platform we're all looking at right now, uh, it is an open source software that is super useful no matter what kind of research you do, what kind of uh, coding you do. Uh, this software allows you to create this kind of thing that we're all looking at here called a notebook. So a notebook is a file where you can mix up images, LaTeX, so equations, uh, text, HTML code, if you want to uh, make text that looks good, and code all in the same file. So it's great for creating material for workshops, for instance, but it's also great for uh, sharing results. Uh, you know, if you want to somebody to be able to reproduce what you did, you can give them a pretty precise explanation here using math and images, and then the code that you use to arrive at a certain result, and they can reproduce it by themselves exactly, with all the explanations and everything. So I find it very, very useful. And uh, this is what we're going to be using today. Those of you who never used Jupyter before, uh, we're going to be executing some Python code. If you've never seen Python before or never even coded before, don't worry. I will break down line by line what's going on here. But if you click on a cell that has some code in it, and you see that the uh, border is uh, blue, that means this is your active cell. When you have an active cell and you press shift enter or shift return, for those of you uh, using a Mac, this is going to run this code. And it's going to tell us what, uh, what the answer is, if the code is uh, outputting any answer. So let's all go ahead, select this first cell here and press shift enter. So you'll see a little asterisk pop up here for a minute, and then you'll see a number. That means your code ran. So what is this code doing? I am uh, importing a couple of libraries, so uh, code that other people wrote uh, that I'm going to use here today. I am generating a function, f of x, where x returns the cosine of 1.5 times pi times x. So this is just uh, y equals to cosine of 1.5 times pi times x. And then I am generating a bunch of samples, x and y of this function that we just created. And I'm adding some random noise to it to make it look uh, a little bit more real. So again, 
this function cosine of 1.5 times pi times x plus some random noise. And if we run the second cell here, shift enter, this should produce the graph we're seeing here. Did everybody get that? Everybody dead? All right. So what are we looking at here? Well, I generated a uh, function f star. It is a known function that describes a relationship between x and y. And then I added some noise to it to simulate a population where, you know, things don't fall exactly on the line. Uh, they will be more or less on average uh, following the line here. So I know what F star is. I know what is the true function that generated my data, the blue dots. Now let's try to use some machine learning to uh, estimate from the blue dots, see if we can get back something that looks like our F star. So the first thing I'll do is linear regression. So there's a library in Python called scikit-learn. Remember that name. If you're interested in machine learning, this is the place to start. Scikit-learn for uh, complete neophytes. This is the best library ever. Why? If I want to fit a linear regression to some data, it is as simple as this. So from the library scikit-learn, the submodule linear model, I will import some code called linear regression. I will call it with parentheses here to say I am initializing this code that does linear regression. And then you, you guys can skip this part here, it doesn't matter. Then I'll pass my data, the x's and the y's to a little function called fit in this code linear regression that we just initialized here. So linear regression dot fit, pass my data, the axes and the y's, and boom, I got myself a linear regression model. Easy uh, as that. For, for those of you who uh, find uh, Python easy to read, I know uh, it, if it's the first time you're looking at this, it might not be as easy uh, to read through this, but I, I'll try to break it down for everybody here. So uh, let me know if uh, you know my breakdown here didn't make sense to you, but this is what we're doing. We're fitting a linear regression to the blue dots here. Now, question for you. What do you think is gonna happen? Is linear regression going to be a good representation or a good uh, approximation of the red curve here? Probably not, right? So let's see, I will, call from the same code called linear regression here. And now that I have fit it to my data, I'll call a new function called predict. And I'll pass some new X uh, values that I did not use to fit my linear regression. I'll pass it to predict and I'll store them in this variable called Y hat. For those of you who are familiar with statistics and using the hat to say, uh, you know, this is what my model is estimating as the true values of y. So I'll run this. Oh, I forgot to run this cell. And the, Lucas, there is a yes. question when you're able to answer it in the chat. So Sahil is asking, I can't seem to run the cells. It's stuck on the asterisk for me. Does anyone else uh, have this issue? So yeah, Sahil, uh, that's unfortunate because uh, we're 80, uh, what, 40 people here today? Uh, using the same compute resources. And I think they might have not been enough for all this crowd. So some of you, that's going to run a little bit slower, but eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to run. I'm really sorry about that. All right, so uh, I ran this guy. I fit my linear regression. I will predict using some values that I did not use to fit the model. And let's plot this on a graph against the blue dots. So I got rid of the red curve. It's the same blue dots, but here is the best straight line linear regression that best fits the blue dots. Looks nothing like 
the actual F star. In our case here, well, we know of what F star is, so we're cheating, but I imagine we didn't. Imagine we observed this data out in the wild. We know just by looking at this graph that linear regression is not the way to go to model what we have observed, right? Now, see this number here? That is our in-sample error. So we were talking just now in the slides. If I take a new sample to evaluate my f of x, one way is to see, well, what is the value of the error that I am incurring in by using this model to describe what I have observed? And this number here is the mean squared error uh, normalized, also known as the uh, R squared measure. So for those of you who remember from stats, this is uh, the R squared. You can read this guy. Uh, if you ignore formality, uh, you can read this guy as 50% of the time, I am not getting the right answer. So 50% of my predictions here are dead wrong. That is a bad performance as expected by looking at the graph. Now let's try using polynomial regression. Well, this is a curve after all. Maybe there is a polynomial that can draw a curve that fits this. So let's give it a try. So in this library called scikit-learn, I can use that same guy, linear regression, that I was using before, but I need to transform my data first. I need to add a new variable, whereas I had x before, I will add another variable, x squared. So I can uh, fit a uh, uh, degree two polynomial to the data. The way you do this in uh, scikit-learn is there's this guy here called polynomial features that lives in the pre-processing module. I start this code here, initialize it with degree two because I want to fit a parabola to this. Then I take my data x and I will fit transform x using this polynomial features code here. So all this is doing is getting a column of values X that I originally had and returning a matrix that has two columns, one for X, another for X squared. This is what this guy here is doing. I'll store it in a new variable called X poly. And then I will fit a new model, not to X, but to X poly and Y. And then I'll do that same transformation x poly to a new sample that I did not use to fit f of x. And I'll plot it. So you can do shift enter. And much better. Just looking at the graph, it seems like a polynomial regression is doing a better job at describing what I observed. Again, we're cheating because we know what the real f star is. So we know that this is not a good answer. But if the blue dots uh, were collected out in the wild, I might have suspected that this could be a good answer. Another way of looking at it is, again, the R squared uh, measure. I am at 92%. That is much better than 50% we had before. Can we improve on this? Can we do better? Let's try a neural network. As I told you, a neural network is just a type of function f of x that happens to be super complicated. And uh, as it is super complicated, it can mimic any kind of function that uh, you can imagine. So uh, to fit a neural network, I will do just like linear regression from the scikit-learn library in the neural network submodule. There is some code that somebody wrote called MLP regressor. MLP stands for multi-layer perceptron. It's a mouthful and a, it's a cool uh, computer science name, but all it is is a function f of x is a type of neural network. So I'll initialize one of those guys here. You don't have to worry about the parameters I'm passing to it. If there's time at the end, I'll explain to you guys what those are, but uh, let's just start a neural network here. Let's fit it to our x's and y's, just like we did with linear regression. Then uh, apply it to a sample that was not used to fit our neural network, and then plot it. So shift enter, and look at what happened. 
using a more complicated type of function f of x, it was able to capture the nuance here. There's a little curve that then bottoms out and then goes up not as a straight line, but kind of curved. So this is much closer to f star, the one we used in the beginning to generate this. And if we look at the R squared again, well, it's at 97%. It's much better than 92 already. So I would say that, well, this is a good estimate of F star. Uh, fourth degree polynomial works better. Yeah, we can try that. Instead of degree two, let's try degree four and run this guy. Indeed, did a, a little bit better than uh, the 97%. 28 to 98%. So this is how it works in practice. Uh, there's a question here in the chat. So, but does the neural network know or tell that it is a cosine function? How do we gain knowledge and not just fitting? So that is an awesome question that I don't think we have time to dive into today because the answer is pretty complicated. But uh, in a nutshell, you should always treat mach machine learning as, a, as an estimation problem locally. What does that mean? Well, a cosine function is periodic, right? So if I, uh, in here, uh, I'm using x from zero to one, so I'm limited to the values of x that I can use to fit my neural network. What happens if I extend x to a more than one? Well, my neural network has not seen any x greater than one. So it can't know what is the shape of f star outside of this range here, because it hasn't seen it. So locally, it works. But if I tried to pass uh, values outside of this range and try to predict them using my neural network, it would not figure out that is a periodic function. Now, could it? Is there a way that I can model periodic things using neural networks? The answer is yes, there is a way, but we're not gonna talk about it today. We're gonna keep it uh, at the introductory level. Does that answer your question, uh, Seppo? Yes, thanks. All right, any other questions before we move on? I'm going to have you people do uh, some exercises, see this in practice next. So uh, any questions before we move on? No, everybody good? All right. So uh, let's skip this part here. I encourage you uh, to come back here if there's time at the end or uh, by the way, the server here where the, those things are running is going to stay up throughout the day. So after the workshop, if you want to come back here and see the, the rest of the, the lecture here, you can run the code. Uh, it's all described in text here, but uh, it goes into uh, some details, some nuances of uh, what we just did here. Uh, it's going to talk about it. So the thing I just said to answer Sipple's question. So what happens if I try to predict stuff that it's outside the range of my original sample? There's an example of that here. Uh, and there's more stuff that I encourage you to read through if you're, if you're interested. But for now, let's skip. Let's skip this and go over to our real example number one, flower species classification. Let's all go scroll down to the flower species classification problem. All right, so in this example that we're going to do together, we have a data set where there's uh, a bunch of variables X that represent measurements of flowers. So uh, the uh, length of the flowers petals and the width of the petals and then uh same thing for the sepal whatever that is i don't know what a sepal is uh and then the variable that we're trying to predict that is the species what kind of flower is it so from x physical measurements of flowers let's see if we can model 
what the species is. All right, uh, this is the uh, famous iris data set, if that rings a bell to anybody out there. Uh, so we're gonna do some machine learning here to see if we can figure out from physical measurements what type of flower is the individual. So the first thing we'll do is let's read the iris data set. And I'm storing the variable names here in this headers uh, variable because this function here, read CSV from the pandas package, uh, you need to inform, you know, what is the actual, what are the names of the variables? Because it's not in the file that we're reading. So I'm reading a CSV file with some data using this guy, pandas. And I'm storing it in a variable called iris dataset. So let's go ahead and do that. So a uh, good first step, whether you're doing stats or machine learning is to have a look at the data, just print it, see what's going on here. So uh, we can observe a few things of interest here. Uh, thing number one, all the variables, if I had no knowledge of what they are, if I just had numbers, well, I know that they are numbers. Those are probably not flags representing categories. They are actual quantities. I can tell that because, uh, you know, they're not round numbers. So from the get-go, I know that. That is important to know. Second thing is they seem to be mostly, almost all in the same order of magnitude. So that is good. Apart from this guy here, uh, it seems that it is one ordered down from the others, but not too bad, not too far. It's good to keep that in mind as well. Second thing, well, let's do some summary statistics. Always a good thing to do. So I can, uh, from the iris data set, this guy, since I used a read CSV function out of this library called pandas, this guy is now an object. It is an object called a data frame. So for those of you who are our users, you're at home. This guy is a data frame, just like in R. And many of the functions that data frames have in R, they also have an, an, an analog in pandas most of the time. Not always, but most of the time, whatever you would do in R, you can do in pandas. One of those things is, well, summary statistics, the describe function does that for us. So I'll go ahead and describe my data frame. And we can look at uh, mean, median, maximum, minimum, see if we can spot anything weird here. For example, if the maximum of one of the variables was a million, and then the median, the mean are six or seven, well, it got a problem. Uh, most models or functions that we would try to model those huge outliers uh, would end up uh, giving us weird results. Some functions are more sensible, or sensitive, I should say, to outliers. For example, if you pick uh, a function that is flexible, like a neural network, you have to be careful because maybe it would try to model that outlier. It would try to go get that point uh, where uh, X has a value of a million, for example. So it's good to look at summary statistics, see if anything is weird before we continue. Uh, next. Let's see if there are any imbalances in our data. So if we're trying to model from the physical measurements, what is the species? Uh, I should have examples, uh, more or less the same amount of examples for each species. Otherwise, I might get very good at predicting one type, but not the other. So let's check, are there any imbalances in my data? And no, it's perfectly balanced. I have 50 examples of each species, so that's good. Uh, Wade is asking, I imagine there are outlier classification routines as well. Uh, outliers are a problem no matter, no matter where you go. And uh, this is one of the applications of ML, uh, actually. It's quality control. So you can train a classifier to spot outlier versus, well, not outlier. And uh, this way, keep an eye on uh, whenever something weird pops up you have a function that tells you that, well, you have something that is not normal. Um, so quality control is one of the applications of machine learning. Uh, but 
for uh, if that's not what you're doing, classifying outlier versus not outlier, and you have outliers in your data, uh, you have to reason about them, just like in stats. Is that outlier really an outlier, or is it important for me to model that guy? Should I worry about it? Okay. Uh, all right. Next thing, let's look at correlations between variables. Why do we do this? Because that could inform us uh, what is the shape of, of the curves. If I would plot this uh, in a graph, I would not be able to visualize this as we had in the, uh, the 2D case when I had two variables. I have one, two, three, four variables. So that would be a 4D graph. We can't see that. We're uh, mere humans. So one way of uh, working around that is uh, looking at pairs of variables. So you plot them uh, one against the other and see if you can visualize any patterns here. So it seems like some of them are linearly or almost linearly correlated. Some of them are not, but uh, you should be able to look for weird things here or patterns that you know jump out to the eye because that would help you choose what type of f of x should I try in this thing in the first place. All right, next thing, I just read a CSV. So all my observations are right now in this Iris dataset guy. So the first thing I'll do is create that first sample to fit my model and the other sample where, where I'll test it. So there's a function in scikit-learn called train test split that does just that. So I'm telling it, take X and Y and create a test set that is 20% of the observations and the other 80 are going to go to the training set. So uh, X train and Y train will have 80% of the Xs and the Ys and then X test and Y test will have 20% of the Xs and the Ys. So I run this guy. And uh, since here, my uh, output variable, the thing I'm trying to predict is not a number, it's not a quantity, but rather a flag, a class, what type of flower it is. I will use a logistic regression, just like in the examples in the slides where we had students who either passed or failed. So I will use logistic regression here. And I am also going to import those two uh, pieces of code here, the accuracy score and something called a confusion matrix. You'll see why in a minute. So just like linear regression before, I'll initialize the code that does logistic regression. And then I will call fit on my training set, which is X train and Y train. So those two variables containing 80% of my data fit it. Then I'll take X test. So a bunch of X's that I did not use to fit my logistic regression model. And I will call the prediction function to see what the model thinks the types of flower are. So if I print the predictions, it, so my model thinks that whatever the first uh, set of X variables in this guy here were, thinks it is a iris versicolor, second one is, a, is an iris stoza, whatever that is, and so on and so forth. And I can use that function that I had imported just now, accuracy score, to just run through all the predictions I just made and see how many of them I got right. So if I print it, I got 93% of the predictions correctly with a logistic regression model. Another way of looking at it that is very useful is this so-called confusion matrix. So if I run this guy, what you'll see is this. What is this picture? So on the y-axis here, I have the true label. And on the x-axis, I have whatever my model predicted it to be. So let's see. When the true label was iris cystosa, I predicted iris cystosa eight times. When the true label was iris cystosa, I predicted iris versicolor zero times. Iris virginica, zero times. So I got all of the iris cystosas perfectly. Didn't make any mistakes. 
Now let's see iris versicolor. When it was iris versicolor, I predicted iris cystosa zero times. That's good. It was iris versicolor, and I predicted iris versicolor seven times. But then for iris versicolor, I predicted iris virginica two times. I made two mistakes and so on and so forth. I got iris virginica here perfectly, didn't make any mistakes. So that is why I didn't get 100%. My model does not seem very good at predicting things when it's iris versicolor. So that lets you reason about, okay, uh, what else could I adjust to try and make my model get those guys here right? We're not going to do that today. I'm just showing you the tool to start reasoning about it. But what we will do, we're going to take the easy path and we're going to bring out the big guns. Instead of using a logistic regression, we're going to try something uh, fancier. And uh, we'll try a decision tree. So same workflow as before. We run it and I get 97% of the predictions right. Still making one mistake. I could try to tweak things around and see if I can uh, make it better. But what we'll do is try an even more complicated model, a support vector machine. Can run that. And uh, that didn't fix it. Still making that same mistake. It was a versicolor, and I predicted Virginica. But there you go. Just to show you that there is this tool you can use to start reasoning about, well, what kinds of mistakes my model is making and how can I fix them, all right? Uh, now, Seppo is asking, but now you're sort of using the test set in training since you're using the test info to improve your model. That is exactly right. And that is why in the uh, slides, I tell you to use three of them. Why? Because what we just did here, we kind of use implicitly or indirectly, I use my evaluation set to guide my function fitting. So I am introducing some bias here. I am picking functions that are good, not only at fitting this sample, but this one too. So, you know, there, there's some uh, infiltration here happening. Uh, there's bias that I'm introducing. That is why we should use a third sample to get a less biased estimate of our out of sample error. Didn't do it in uh, the exercise here, but we should have. Seppo, thank you for your observation. That is exactly right. Okay, so next one is an exercise for you guys to do. It is essentially the same thing we just did with a different data set. Instead of predicting the type of flowers uh, from physical measurements of flowers, you're going to try to predict what is the type of wine given chemical measurements of different wines. So there's three types of wine in here and then a bunch of chemical measurements of the wine. So uh, I'll give you five minutes. Would that be enough? You can essentially go up here and copy and paste everything if you want. Uh, but try to read you know, that code and see if you can at least get a sense of what it is doing. I tried my best to break it down for you, but uh, give it a try. And uh, post on the chat what percentage accuracy you get. All right, let's do five minutes. This is great, Lucas. Uh, we've had a few people join us late and they wanted to uh, hop into the Jupyter Notebook. So uh, if their name isn't there, we've told them to grab a username that isn't taken and just make sure that they indicate that it's, it belongs to them now. <laughs> yeah, so we uh, had a good idea there. We have up to user 99. So uh, ah, okay. grab up to 99, that should work. Super. And I'll also mention that we officially only have five minutes left. So it'll have to be a pretty quick uh, wrap if you don't oh, want to I run over. <laughs> one last example that uh, is pretty cool. 
and people can stay. Yeah, the last example here is image classification. So oh yeah, let's make sure we squeeze that in. Okay. We've been using numbers. Numbers are easy. What happens when your data is an image and uh, not numbers? So we'll we'll see that next. So uh, Carolyn is asking, uh, want to ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Lucas, so uh, thanks again. I just was wondering, so it looks like once you've established like all of the potential functions that you could think of, you just run your data set through every single one and then you check your RMSE or whatever criteria you want in terms of seeing how good it is. So is there any stage of this where the person that's, um, that's running the machine learning is like prioritizing or thinking through like let's run this first is that important or does it not matter at all you know like like a in terms of the efficiency of the modeling time in terms of like you know telling your reader like oh i selected this function first because we know that it has this distribution or this uh bivariate distribution so i'm just wondering if you could like talk a little bit more about that yeah absolutely so it has been the case up until very recently that machine learning is uh, as much of a sci and science as it is an art. So uh, it comes with experience. What type of algorithm do I use in each scenario? And once I picked a good one, what buttons and knobs do I have to turn and, and press to make it be you know, the, the best one possible? So it used to be very much an art, but uh recently a lot of research has been uh paying attention to the problem of uh hyperparameter optimization it's a mouthful tool and uh, it's a uh computer science term but what it means is how do we automate what you just asked about you know how can i automatically scan through a grid of different combinations of uh types of f of x different configurations for each f of x and uh automatically find which one is the best one so there's a lot of attention in research being given to that and uh lots of advances have been made uh there's a lot lots of uh, libraries and code out there uh ready for you to use we're not going to talk about it today but in even in scikit learn itself there are functions for you to do just that automatically tell it, okay, try logistic regression, try support vector machines, try neural networks. And for each one of those models, try this configuration and that configuration, and just tell me which one is the best one. Does that answer your question? It does. And it's also telling me so much about why people that do machine learning are so concerned about computing power. Because you, just you got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is a big part of it. Yes. And Lucas, um, uh, Seppo says, this is great. And he's wondering if it's possible to have access to the Jupyter instance longer than just the end of today. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'll talk to the people who are running this uh, infrastructure Leave it up until maybe, I don't know, end of the week. Yeah, that would be great to let people play around a bit. That's super. Yeah, there's a couple other notebooks that are more advanced, but uh, they're there available if you want to have a look. Uh, we can leave it up until the end of the week. And uh, we are at 2020. If you want to show us quickly the image classification, um, that would yes. be super or or answer questions. Yeah, let's do the image classification real quick here because uh, that is uh, an interesting problem. And that is one of the things that kind of uh, sparked the last iteration in the AI revolution. It was using the concepts that we learned today on images. Believe it or not, that is what started a lot of the uh, things that we see today uh, that ended up ended up leading to chat GPT and whatnot. It all started with the image problem. So uh, let's have a look. So uh, let's try a second type of classification here. So instead of classifying flowers based on physical measurements of flowers, let's see if we can tell apart apples and oranges based on images of apples and oranges. So this first section here, 
will show you if you execute this. This is how a computer sees an image. So what is an image from the perspective of a computer? It's pixels. You have all heard that word before, pixel. But what is a pixel? It's this number here, 255. What does that mean? It means that in this position in the image, so if I were able to render this uh, matrix here in a more uh, observable way, you would see that this value here corresponds to the very corner of the image here. And 255 means, well, that is the intensity of color that I should see at that very position in the image. So 255 means intensity up to the max, and that gives us the color white. There's another layer of complexity to this. Uh, from the point of view of a computer, an image is not just one of those matrix matrices of uh, pixels. It's actually three of them layered on top of one another. Maybe you've heard already uh, about something called RGB channels, red, green, blue. So any colored image is actually a composition of three images in those colors, red, green, and blue. And the pixels in each one of those three images represent the intensity of color in each one of those three images. And when you place them one on top of the other, the different intensities of red, green, and blue blend together to create the colors we see on our screens. So all that to say that from the point of view of a computer, an image is a matrix. It's numbers. And we can do machine learning with numbers, that long-winded way of saying that. So here's how we see the same information. It's an apple. And I just to illustrate the whole uh, three uh, types of colors layered on top of one another, I can look at the uh, first channel, the second channel. So the library I'm using here is not going to let you see the red, green, and blue. It's going to look all blue, but trust me, it's red, green, and blue. And uh, the blue channel here. So when I layer those three on top of one another, I get the actual image of the uh, apple, but it's all numbers. Same thing for the orange. So I can look at an orange here. We can do the same thing we did with the wine data set and the iris data set and split uh, in this folder here. I have a huge collection of images of apples and oranges. We can split them into uh, a training and a test sets, just like we did for wine and flowers. So it's doing this for the apples. And I encourage you to read through this. I wrote it uh, step by step with some uh, illustrative variable names here. And then uh, a Python one liner that does the same thing in one line. Uh, see if you can understand how it's the same thing as an exercise to get uh, used to reading the code examples you're going to find on the web. Because uh, code examples on the web typically are not very readable, not very user friendly. They don't spell out what's going on. It's all going to be one liners and fancy stuff. So I left this in here uh, so you can get used to it. Uh, so do the same thing for the oranges. Uh, just doing some data pre processing here. You can read through it and see what's doing because we're running out of time. Just want to get through this quickly. Let's create the test set. And we're going to use a logistic regression to try and separate the images of apples from images of oranges. So I'll run this. And you can see that a simple model like logistic regression can separate apples and oranges perfectly. Why? Does anybody want to take a crack? Because the apple will be higher on the red, I guess, than the other values, like just the probability of being a red uh, pixel. Exactly. The colors are pretty different, right? There are no examples in my data where I have a reddish orange and an orangish apple. So it's as easy as that for a logistic regression to separate them. The colors are very explicitly different. But if I had 
different types of apples, like a Spartan and a Macintosh, that's a more interesting problem because uh, maybe color is not so important. Maybe shape counts more. So, uh, And there you go. That's what I wanted to show you. And then there's an exercise here with images as well. But instead of fruit, you have digits. So I picked the digits 0, 6, and 8. Sometimes when you write them fast, they kind of look alike. So uh, you will train a model to try to tell them apart. Images of handwritten zeros, six, and eights. So I'll leave that as an exercise. And uh, there you go. That's all I had to share with you today. Feel free to ask any questions on the Slack channel. I'll be around all day. And I'll ask the infra guys to uh, leave the cluster up uh, until Friday so you can play around with it.